Welcome to another pint with Shawnee B coming to you from the trendy Shoreditch area of London where all the new incubator companies are setting up. I'm in a classic example here. It's uh, called The Rise. My guest is companies based here. We have, a, we have a, a world right now that is awash with the ills and evils of technology and where it's bringing us unchecked. However, on a pint with Shawnee B, we occasionally like to stop blabbering on about that and look at some of the brighter clouds on the horizon and uh, my guest today is an example of that. She is involved in a company called Desolinator which she will talk about a little bit later and she's also travelled the world. She's quite young, I don't know what age she is but she's significantly younger than myself and it's always good to have (laughs) a nice up and coming uh, member of the world talking with us because they're responsible for cleaning up the mess that my generation has left for them. And welcome to the podcast, Lou Bleach. How are you? Hello, very good. Tell me about the rise. Tell me about where you're living here. It's great. It's got rocking chairs. and It's got rocking chairs. It's got a cactus garden. It's got motivational posters. Mm. It's got some very, very, very stressed out startups. (laughs) What do you have to do to get in here? So this is actually a building which is run by Barclays. Oh. Very smartly, they've done a building specifically for financial tech, so fintech. So yeah, you're not fintech. We're not fintech no. at all. But they've reserved on one floor a big area for all these sort of impact entrepreneurs. So we actually share an office with guys who do um, vertical farming, a woman who's designing a hydrogen car, guys who do aquaponics. People who design 3D printed artificial limbs for kids um, that change as they grow. Thankfully, the, the what's in it for Barclays is that they can be your business banking partners. Uh, we bank with them, right. so I think they bring in companies that they think will eventually turn quite a lot of profit. Is it a sort of um, corporate social responsibility thing for them? Or? So it's a program called the Unreasonable Impact Program and they've mm-hmm. partnered with these guys called Unreasonable Institute who are out of Boulder, Colorado. Amazing company. Their reason for being is to support what they believe are to be the companies that are going to help the world, change the world. So these are just millionaires who want to do make good or? Ex-Google, ex-MIT. Okay. So millionaires. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> no? I mean, I, yeah, but... But it, still young, still need to do something. Still, right. still young, super smart, and basically they work to accelerate these companies. So the mm. idea is, is you partner with Unreasonable Impact and within five years you're impacting over a million people. Okay. But there, are, I could not sing their praises more. I used to live in Denver for two years. I quite liked it there. So oh, I was nice. Up in, I was Boulder, just up the road. I used yeah. To quite a bit. The whole team is um, very fit and yes, very, it's a very good looking. Yeah, very vegan sort of. Yeah. Deep grassy, <laughs> yeah. All the things that we don't do here in Ireland and, and Britain. There so let's are, talk about this desalinator thing sure. and what it is, and we will come back to your life and all the <laughs> Okay. So Desolinator is a clean tech company. Basically what we've developed is a painted technology that can desalinate and purify water, but using only solar. Ah. It boils it. Yeah, so it's a, it's a slightly more sophisticated yeah. version of di- distillation. But the kind of IP smart bit of the technology is how we use the solar panel, how we harvest the heat, harvest the electricity, and then how we recycle that heat back into the device. Mm. So there's something that exists which is a similar concept, which is a solar still. If you're ever desert, on a d- desert island or on a shipwreck, you can distill your seawater and drink it. Mm-hmm. Whereas solar still on a standard size will probably do one litre a day. Okay. We're doing 20 to 25. So what's happened it to, to probably... Sp- where your company to the top of the mountain is the cost of solar panels has come right down. Is that correct? I think that's definitely going to help in terms of our manufacturing. Right. Um, but the kind of reason for being of this company was the fact that, I mean, 98% of all of our water is in our sea. Mm-hmm. We're approaching a huge water crisis. Yeah. The UN estimates that by 2030, half of the world will actually struggle to access a reliable source of water. Right. So we're sitting on this massive resource, 98% of all the water, and yet... And that water's rising. And that water's rising. (laughs) Um, But the people who are only really able to tap into it are places like the UAE, Dubai, the Emirates, 
where they desalinate, but the way that they desalinate requires huge amounts of oil. So to get three barrels of water, you actually need one barrel of oil. That's the ratio. So as well as it being incredibly cost prohibitive, it's also very polluting. So in terms of, I don't want to say democratizing desalination, Mm. but allowing people and communities and even certain countries who are either coastal or have salt water intrusion or who have really horrific contamination for example the bay of bengal which has insane levels of arsenic we're trying to create a form of purification and desalination where all you need is the sea or a contaminated water source Mm. and sunlight was your idea a guy in a garage came up with it or actually yeah it was so our founder who has about 30 years of engineering experience was living in Abu Dhabi I think he was living next to one of the large desalination plants and would just wake up every single day look out the window and just be like there there has to be a better way I think the country with the most fresh water in the world is Canada right they're saying things like that will be the new oil fresh water will be the new oil Tell me what your guys' aha magic moment was when he's staring out over these big industrial plants and what did he come up with? I would like to say that it was a sudden aha moment, Mm. but I think it was actually a labor of a few months trying to figure out, you know, what could we do? Going down the academic route of reading papers of what works and then changing it to how he thought it should work and then making prototype after prototype after prototype. To, so he started this about 2013, mm-hmm. just in his garage with his incredibly patient wife. And it was only until he got we, he got a um, almost scholarship and a bursary from Climate Kick in the UK mm-hmm. that was able to spur further development. Of and it. now it's a real thing about to and now it's, big, You were working in Kenya, right? Yeah, so I was in a, a project that is so close to my heart. It's, um, yeah, so I was in Lake Takana in northern Kenya which is a bit cowboy land Kenya's an incredible country it's come on so much in the past few years some of the most high tech farming is coming out of there Mm -hmm. yeah so they're the second largest producers of roses in the world after Holland uh, after Holland just because they have invested so much money in developing infrastructure and things like that Mm. but there's almost this line that's been drawn in the sand of when you get to northern Kenya which is very arid, a lot of desert, the development kind of stops Mm. and there's a a lot of guns everywhere and the people there are nomadic pastoralists, which means that they don't settle, they don't do any agriculture, Mm. they move around with their herbs and uh, herbs, (laughs) herds, herbs and herds herds. (laughs) Um, of cattle and it's still very, very tribal. So there's a lot of tribal warfare and it's a semi dangerous like kind of untouched place to be. So how did you pick that place? They were you got a grant from Kenya? Or? Because well there's this lake which is there called Lake Takana, mm. which is also known as the cradle of mankind. They oh, found yeah. the oldest fossils of Homo sapiens there. Mm-hmm. Does it feel like that when you're there? No, you just They're feel hot. Spooky and vibes now. Sweaty. And the water there is becoming more and more contaminated with salt and with fluoride. And this is because of a project which is going on just past the border in Ethiopia, where they've stopped the river flow into this lake. And they've just diverted it to agricultural projects. But because it's on their side of the border... Wars have started for less. Definitely. So now all of these tribes, about a million tribes that live around this lake, are starting to get really horrific diseases from drinking this water on a daily basis Mm. so you see kids with completely bow legs there's a lot of preeclampsia there's obviously your standard cholera dysentery Mm. but there's all these diseases coming out of the salt and the fluoride and these are some of the oldest tribes in kenya actually in that whole region of africa there's no technology available to them that's able to deal with that level of contamination so specifically salt and fluoride in quite marketing terms i guess we've always been like we go where everyone else fears to go yeah. and deal with fears to trend. yeah yeah uh, you should meet our other co-founder he's very <laughs> big ideas big picture 
And when we kind of got approached to do this project, we were like, well, you know, put your money where your mouth is, I guess. So so you're bringing, so let's go back to the technology. The, yes. The, the, the technology that you're now employing in this area, is, is, it, is this like a beta test for you if you get this right? Does the law start uh, coming in or you're working all over the world? Well, or? we're kind of working all over the, okay. the world. So at, at the moment, we're testing, we're on sort of our beta going onto our gamma prototypes and mm. we're stress testing them in Dubai and Cyprus. Um, so what's the idea that they hadn't found before that you, you guys found? So there's other ways that you can remove salt and really, really bad mm. contaminants from water. So there's a process called reverse osmosis, yeah. and that's done through membranes. Mm. But that requires a lot of energy, so it's normally powered by a diesel generator. Yeah. But it also requires, because it's filtered through membranes, you have to change the membranes every two months. Now you imagine going to somewhere like Lake Tucano where there's only camels and no electricity. Yeah. Even if you did have the money and the means to have a diesel generator, you're still having to transport that diesel from somewhere. And because the membranes need to be changed every two to three months, it means that you, first of all, need membranes, which normally come from Germany. And you also need someone who has a lot of technical expertise to be able to open up this big reverse osmosis plant and change them. So if you're talking about going to either islands or remote places like Lake Tacana, it's just not... A feasible option you need something that works simply that is easily maintained so you could train a farmer to be able to do it and you need something that runs for free mm. so that runs on solar right so is it mainly a solar play that the solar provides the energy to do something yes. similar to what other things do exactly okay. and on a smaller it feels a little bit more micro than macro like it's not a big you haven't got time to build a huge plant so it's Something that a farmer yeah. can buy a few of and yeah, a exactly. community can get a few of yeah. and put in place. Okay. So our community models, the idea is we're trying to engineer it so you can ship it in a 40-foot container mm -hmm. enough for over 10,000, something they'll produce over 10,000 litres a day. Okay. So, well, there's, yeah. they're not short of sunshine down there. No. <laughs> it was the most unrelenting heat I have ever experienced in my life. I went to do um, the water testing and the feasibility and meet the community members, talk to the tribes, talk to the chiefs. Is there any pushback? No. They, they're really, really sick. Yeah. This sounds like there's not a lot of money coming from the farmers there. So who, who no. sponsors the whole thing? Who makes them? So the, the... this is part of our like humanitarian grant funded right. work. So last year, I went to Dubai to pitch Expo 2020. Mm -hmm. Have you heard? They, they heard of it, yeah. yeah, they do like the big expositions yeah. in like Milan. And, yeah. But Dubai being Dubai, they're hosting it in a few years. And as part of it, they've, they have this big grant scheme to support 20 companies that they think are going to... That they can shed, then show off at. Right? At the Expo. Here's what they do. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you should see the plans of this place. They're building a whole city mm -hmm. where a city doesn't exist yet. When you look at Dubai and the Middle East, they have a huge looming issue as well, which is their oil will eventually run out. And they don't have any water. They don't have, well, they don't have their, their whole infrastructure is built around it. It's built you on know? dust and dreams. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. the strangest place to I went go to Dubai to. for the first time last year or two years ago. It was like as if someone had been given a trillion dollars to build skyscrapers as quickly as possible. But that is, that, that is exactly what they're Without really knowing why. <laughs> yeah. Most of them are empty. I know, I know. To me, yeah. it just looks like a post-apocalyptic world mm, where mm. all where there's Max, no yeah. trees, there's just dust and diamonds. It's hard to get booze there. It's not good if you're Irish. Yeah, it's really, no. Pint with Shawnee B becomes a laxy with Shawnee B. <laughs> um, so everything goes really well with this company. Tell me what it looks like in 20 years' time. Have we solved our water problem? 20 years' time? I'd, I would, like, I can't say that it would solve the water problem because it's it would be very arrogant to say that us as one company can solve it. Well. Everything going well. Do you everything, think it's possible I think to solve the everything, water everything going well, I hope that we can contribute in a very big way to a more sustainable approach to water. Have you got a bunch of competitors who are doing similar things that are all, are you, are you, is this a gold rush at the moment to see if you can get the... The ecosystem is varied. No one is doing 
specifically what we're doing. Mm. But it's similar to the re- approach of renewable energy. The more people that are doing it and the healthier yeah. and more competitive the ecosystem is only going to be better mm-hmm. for future somebody generations. Will, somebody will crack it. Yeah. So someone needs to crack it. But yeah. I just, similar to development to water, to energy, to anything, there's never going to be one silver bullet solution. I mm-hmm. think there's got to be a lot of players within the fil- field who mm-hmm. can approach the problem from different ways. Mm. I mean, to give you a more concrete example, I'd love to be able to replace bringing in plastic bottles. Yeah. For example, if you take something like the Maldives, the, those islands don't have any fresh water. The hotels there will bring in hundreds of thousands of plastic bottles every year for their guests. Now, let's say if you put a desolinate on one of those islands, you negate the need for all of that plastic waste. And that this water that you make is drinkable and tasty or drinkable and just drinkable? Well, so what we're producing is completely distilled water, okay. which you can then remineralize to your taste. Right, okay. So Evian yeah. tastes like Evian because it has... I saw my friend said Evian tastes like spit. Sorry, for going. Yeah. Very expensive <laughs> spit. Yeah. It's what I imagine like a French man's spit would yeah. taste like. Not that I, I get it. There, there, there is that. actually a difference <laughs> in taste between some waters. I get it, but yeah, but some you know some water is technically not going to kill you, but it tastes like it's still salty. It tastes like crap. Like yeah, when we're catering to sort of more upscale markets, mm. it means that if a hotel wants their water to taste like Evian, we can actually make okay. our water taste like Evian okay. because it's just simple mineral content. I mean, the other rush to presumably is manufactured water. Through chemistry, through combining the... So do you know how originally water is made? Uh, going back, you know, going okay. back to um, no. the start Tell of me. the world. <laughs> so it's made by stars colliding. Ah. So all the amount of water that we have on Earth is finite. Right. We only have this amount of water. Thankfully, we got a shit ton of it in the glaciers in the sea and things like that but do we need that do we do we not think we're like over engineering the problem so water is yeah it is finite because how it was made is the collision of stars I think that's really beautiful I really like that tell me how it happens then you started it stars collide and stars collide yeah 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 what from the yeah, world? Yeah. oh god so what happens when it the stars was... collide where does the water land oh so gosh I don't know I could I have yeah. technical yeah, fusion, fusion it's, it's so, something to do fusion. with like I did read a paper about it but as with everything quite scientific did you watch the new uh, slightly sheepish documentary of Al Gore's where he's his, his follow up to an inconvenient truth the second one yeah. yes I did so I watched it last month and uh, Kind of sad, but you know the, the the point he makes though, which is quite interesting and encouraging, and also plays into what you just said, is if you get the price of the solar panels down, then suddenly people start seeing business opportunities from Absolutely. making money from doing things that fix the planet and remove carbon and remove fuels. You know, so biofuel, this what you're doing, ways of stopping the plastic yeah. problem. I mean, I there mean, are probably three big ones. Right? I mean, it's all with anything in life it's a question of perspective not to sound cheesy but like all challenges are an opportunity yeah but I mean his point so, is that you know, there's, a, there's a, a, but, a capitalist versus socialist tightrope in these things where the capitalists the oil companies in Texas yeah. where I live uh, who cares about the environment just keep pumping them and keep fracking and keep doing whatever they don't care right? I mean, there's no such thing as global warming there's yeah. no such thing as climate change fuck it all I've got furrowed brow with my worries and then there's the kind of no there is all the time just to say oh shit sure. but like when those Texans who only care about making money start to understand that they can make money from doing stuff that's not screwing up the world it's probably the tipping point that I think Gore was yeah. talking about that we get to which is why companies like you get funding because you need to show proof of concept right yeah for yeah. sure so how does a, 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 and you are young, a girl, like a woman in her 20s, I guess, right? Late 20s. Late 20s, end up in <laughs> what is a, a great job because you're saving the world. What's your background? Where were you born? Oh, I guess by blood. I'm Vietnamese, French, English. Okay. Yeah, a bit of a weird mix. Eurasian. Eurasian, yeah, yeah mongrel. Born in Hong Kong. So my mum is Vietnamese French. Vietnamese French. Okay. And my dad is probably the most English person you've ever met. He moved to Hong Kong when he was 22 to escape marrying an English girlfriend. Oh, 
So we moved to the other side of the world. Who might just have said, no, sorry, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> bit of a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> he then got stuck in a lift with my mum mm. when they were in their... He was in his early 30s, she was in her late 20s. For how long? Uh, stuck in the lift or how yeah. long were they married uh, st- long enough it seems yeah. <laughs> I've never been uh, given the details but quite a romantic story mm-hmm. so I was born there raised there went to school there ended up going to a very strict all girls boarding school where in, in Hong Kong did you live? Uh, top of the mountain oh, next, yeah. the peak the peak lovely, yeah. which was great and then as so what did your dad do there? he's a barrister okay yeah did yeah. you like living in Hong Kong growing up there? I loved growing up there. It was amazing. The first thing that my dad bought with his first big paycheck was an old Chinese fishing trawler, oh. which he brought over from China. Completely Wait, a gutted or a it. A trawler. Wow. But completely gutted it and mm. then turned it into like a family boat, which meant that the front was where they used to lay all the nets down. It was huge. That was the swing pool. Uh, nah. It was just where we'd nap on the way right. on the way home. But that's one of my most vivid, oldest memories. Would, would he sail it? you just drive it. Right, where though? Just to like the islands. The other islands, Nantai and all those. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Walk to the Pigeon Restaurant, which I remember really well. And um, did you go to like that little so the, the American school or whatever they have there the kind of so thing. I went to the French school French school. my first language is French okay. Okay. is it really? yeah and then yeah I moved over to the UK do you still have uh, relatives in Vietnam? so it's kind of a weird story in that my mum lost all contact with her family so she was moved to Paris when oh. she was a bit younger right. during the war it's a bit of a question mark in the family okay. history. Like, we don't know if there was a fallout or... But her whole education until university was paid for and a very good Swiss nunnery. Um, and then she just and you had... you don't know by who? Well, she she knows it was from her family, but she doesn't understand why, okay. what, why it happened that way. And then she basically put herself through university, um, started mm-hmm. her own business, and then... What did she do? She is now the global CEO of a very big diamond company called Narav Modi. Okay. It's so a very, Amir's very, very, uh, <coughs> you worked at De Beers? No, I worked at my agency. And so oh, okay. It was, it was the most secretive account I've ever seen. I was like, yeah, I couldn't, like really cigarettes, have cigarettes and diamonds are the two accounts that are, they're the most solid in agencies because you couldn't find out anything that went on. It was all. Wise. I could picture you in diamonds. No, I didn't reason. do it. It wasn't my account. It was in the yeah. agency. I literally knew nothing about it. They were just everyone sworn to secrecy. It's probably all the stuff they get up to. Blood diamonds, things like that. Yeah. Uh, you're making up for it, though. Um, <laughs> well, trying. Working and so you came agency. here to school. Your secondary school was it? Secondary school. Went to Edinburgh for undergrad and my masters. Okay. In social anthropology. Mm. What was so, that? Like? I loved it so right. much. You you get this uh, world view very early. Yes. You know, from your father. Clearly, your father's a bit of an adventurer, and your you know your mother. And you you have this uh, a lot of travel probably by the time mm-hmm. you were in your teens, which a lot of people don't get to. Did you find that you were noticing problems and? even when you do social anthropology, feeling like I'm going to get involved in this area to fix and make the world better. How do you get to this point in your mind when you're like younger? Would you, did you just fall into it or did I, you think about it? Or? I don't know if being younger and seeing a lot of the world and my mom, my mom always wanted to adopt a girl from Vietnam and she had a lot of ties with orphanages there. So we went a lot as kids. So I think from a young age, I was maybe exposed to, I don't want to say poverty, but different levels but of... realising how lucky you are as, yeah, then, as well. Yeah, that, you know? always realising how I lucky found, I was. I left in 96 uh, and just went, went, went travelling the world for 21 years. But uh, yeah, I found that that... And, and also when it comes to complaining about something, you've seen so many things that are so much worse than the problem that you're confronting right now. Yeah. I, I'm able to take a moment and rationalise myself back into kind of you know, yeah, good, so. what made me switch to wanting to work in development and social enterprise was living in 
Malawi for as long as I did. Okay, so we're coming to the Malawi story. So you've done your you've done your your, your, your masters. Yeah. Is that when the Malawi thing happened? So Tell me what happened there. I. So I did a four month research thesis, mm-hmm. which got me out of London. I went to study spiritual exorcisms in nomadic tribes in the desert, oh, well, which is quite it was just there. <laughs> quite interesting. Spiritual um, exorcisms in. Just on the border of Essaouira in Morocco, right. these you wouldn't even call them a tribe, but sort of a Shaman. group. Sort of, yeah, a group called the Gnawas, who were the really interesting history, but they were the original sort of slaves that were brought over during the Ottoman Empire. That's so right. when all of the slaves were brought out of Africa, Morocco was actually one of the final port of Mm -hmm. course before they were shipped to the americas or Mm -hmm. europe or whatever some of that group managed to stay so they have a really interesting sort of merging of islam tradition and african shamanism and animistic beliefs one of the main rituals that they perform is actually the opposite of an exorcism so an exorcism was when you try and take that doesn't sound good <laughs> is it, and, and an exorcism is when you put the, the opposite take it of putting out. something into you yeah so you put something Hopefully into you good or bad. it's a very beneficial thing the way they view it is that there's jnun or spirits yeah. everywhere and the way that you placate them will create a beneficial harmonious relationship mm-hmm. is to bring them inside and you do that through ecstatic trance, dance, fits. And it's normally that it happens to women. But it's these all-night ceremonies around music and drums and the gumbri, which is actually the original blues guitar. So it has a blues riff. So you're so, going over there when you're a teenager to what, monitor nine, you? Or Nineteen. To, yeah, to monitor them, right? No, to no. do to do to understand what's un- going understand on. what's yeah, going make on. A thesis, make a thesis. Um, so, first of all, you're. Do you believe in it? I went in with because so much is written about spiritual exorcisms mm. or anticisms. There's like the biological explanation where if you Believe trigger you part of your brain, or they use hallucinogenic drugs and mm. things like that. Um, then it's a chemical reaction and your body reacts that way because of X stimuli. And then so there's anthropological explanations being like, well, it's generations and generations of oppression that this is how they release it. Mm-hmm. I went in, Leela, my first ritual, I was like, this is... Scary. This is something else. Was it scary? I think I was just too blown away to be scared right. but it wasn't Were scary you yeah but it wasn't it wasn't how, how does your folks go oh yeah that's fine off you go where are you going I'm just going off to do well I didn't tell them that that okay. was my thesis okay. until I've written it okay. in upward management okay. where's <laughs> Lou I don't know I haven't seen her for a few oh, months oh she's just yeah. maybe like surfing in Morocco but it's it, it sounds like it's a scary thing but it's done in such a way that it's mostly women first of all that do it Any the whole for that or? women are more susceptible to it right right? and the whole premise around it is a very positive thing you don't choose specific people so if you imagine like a group of musicians they're playing and then they have all these rituals so to open the ceremony they sacrifice a goat and bleed it and there's all this amazing cosmology around what happens in the ritual Mm. but it's more as soon as the music starts playing it's random people that will just go into it so it's like an American preacher thing that meets the Beatles in it. Yeah, in so India. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, you're a science, scientific, you know, you're involved in science. I mean, last year I had a whack at Changa, which is a kind of form of yeah, uh, ayahuasca. Good. But, you know, mm-hmm. I, mean, the, the, I mean, the first thing is, is there a spirit world or is there not in your mind? In your mind? Do you think there is or isn't? I think there are... Whether you call them spirits or gods or ghosts or energy, mm-hmm. which ultimately is what everything is. But I think there's a dimension that we don't necessarily perceive in our yeah. everyday life. I think we're becoming much less perceptive to it because we're so removed from having earth under our feet, having big sky over mm-hmm. our head, having... Elemental, elemental yeah. contact with whether it's trees or sea mm. or just dirt. So 
I think there's different ways that you can open those doors of perception, whether it's ayahuasca, hallucinogenic plants, to some extent, yoga, when you get mm. to a certain, like, obviously... Mindfulness like, and all that, yeah. yeah. Mindfulness, or I'm thinking more like the yogis that meditate in the Himalayas for world peace. Like, there's different doors... Doing such a good job, though, really, yeah. <laughs> no, we should give them a but call. It, there, there's <laughs> the issue of whether it's real or whether it's the chemical thing in our mind that creates this reality. So is there yeah. an actual dimension or is the dimension manufactured by chemical goings-on or we see something in our minds that's very different? I've always wondered this and I would like to say that it's reality and how you perceive reality is down to potentially chemical reactions and things. Yeah. But... Uh, have you read Homo Deus by... I've read the you? first, I mean, read the first one, Homo Sapiens. Um, yeah. One of my favourite books, like Anthropology on Crack. Yeah. But his yeah. second one is... Paris great. Phenomenal. Yeah. But there's this one bit of the book that, I mean, it's a bit of a hefty read, but persevere because the last section is the best, where he talks about free will and AI whether free will actually exists or whether mm. internally are we just a bunch of algorithms. Mm. You seem like you have control, but actually it's all down to set factors and stimuli and everything mm. can be reduced to well, certainly Sam Harris or is maths. A, or, Sam Harris on the Waking Up podcast, who's one of the four atheist apocalypse guys, is he's a one million percent convinced we don't have free will. And he has like little examples of of how we don't one of his things is like he says to you uh, so think of a movie don't tell me what movie it is so you got one yeah right and now think of a different movie you got one yeah right and look what happened in that process when I asked you to think of a movie a movie popped into your head there was no part of you that the, went yeah. which movie will I get or maybe two or three did and you did pick one of the three but then when I asked you to pick another one you probably focused a bit more and thought, oh, there's a trick question coming up here. You probably yeah. picked a more obscure one or something. For free will to be a real reality, every movie that you remember or every movie that you've watched mm. probably should, in a split second, line itself up and you go, I'll pick that one. Right? Yeah. Like you're in a big video store, right? Yeah. But what happens is it's just come in. And, and then the other problem he has with free will is if there is somebody inside you that is pulling the triggers, that is saying you know, Lou, I've got to get out of this interview, you know, whatever. <laughs> if that person is in there, but then who's controlling that person? Yeah. And there's another, I heard an interesting one recently, which was the idea that our whole life is a block. If we take space and time as just a thing that we happen to be living in. In other words, our, our life is a hundred pages of a book and I'm in page 50 yeah. at the moment. But I'm, it, it's going to go on till page 100 and then life continues on. I was just one little chapter in this big stream that there's nothing that I can do really, even if I was to get run over by a bus after this, well, my that was my... That, that was it. That was it anyway, <laughs> right? I don't know, but the, the other... We can't, we can't leave with that Westworld, which is the... Did yeah. you see that? Like, yes. I mean, it's, ter- it's, it's got full of holes, but the, the concept... The of concept is, is insane. Yeah. And you start to look at... There's another incredible book called Thank You for Being Late, done by an amazing journalist who has a real knack of reducing quite complex phenomena into some to a simple narrative that's actually yeah. enjoyable to read. I mean, in 2007, there was a collision of hardware, processing power, memory power, and the internet. Things like Airbnb, Facebook, Autodesk, all of these companies emerged from that same year because of a huge a amount bang, of yeah. processing power yeah. available. And he sort of extrapolates that 10, 20 years down the line yeah. in terms of what? AI could become and the speed at which we're going to be suddenly moving. Yeah. I find all of this terrifying. Like, yeah, same here. I'm, I'm glad I don't have kids and I'm glad I don't, won't be around for yeah. years, I think No one knows what's going to happen. The and problem is it's going unchecked. It's going unchecked and the social structures that we have now are not going to be able to keep up. Mm. So from an ethics perspective. Yeah. But they have ethics AI people now who are tiny little voices going tiny yeah. <laughs> what with about their clipboards what about if they kill us all <laughs> and you know there's it's ripe for a, a despot a, an Ozymandias to use technology to create an evil empire that controls all of us or whatever yeah but the, the, the world that you're saving might not be worth saving 
I, I want to finish maybe in this area and talk about the future as you see it, but let's just finish the Malawi. So you, you came back from you came back from, from the, the exorcism. What was your, what was your conclusion on, on the that, exorcism thing? My simple conclusion was there are things that we will never know, and there are right. things that we cannot measure, and to try and explain such a complex phenomena in such reductive terms of it is this, that, or the other is. You're, so you have a bravery about you, do you? Where does that come from? It's not like, you, I don't know. No one, no one goes off and does stuff like I don't that. Know. You know, they went, oh, I read a book about it. <laughs> um, so then, not not content with going to reverse their exorcisms in Morocco, you decided to go to Malawi. Where did that come Well, from? no, there was a tiny chunk before right. that. Okay. I came back and was determined to work for Red Bull and do their marketing because yeah, okay. I loved extreme I have done sports. Some work for them as well. And then just, I just thought, I think I was like young and I was like, I would just want to snowboard and be around those type of crazy people. Um, I remember I was judging the fluke tag in Sydney once. Yeah. <laughs> the fluke tag is a red building where people charge off the edge of a pier in a With the funny machine, little, in a yeah. flying machine of their invention and see who gets the furthest. None of them go very far. But anyway, I was, I was walking around the, the ha- hangar, the paddock, where all of these flying machines were part before the event and I had to judge them for creativity I'm walking around with the head of Red Bull in Australia and I'm sort of going you know a lot of these are death machines <laughs> they have frog drivers waiting to pull people out yeah. of consciousness. and he goes yeah well they've all signed something and I think it struck me that they're the only brand I've ever worked on in advertising whose target audience or who they're interested in sports where the competitors might die yeah that's what they're into yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's it's that fine line between being a complete maniac yeah. or just being. So you're a big into your snowboarding and skiing and all that. Yeah. Right? Okay. Right. Okay. So you wanted to get a job, but then did you get a job with them? So I got. They have an incredibly difficult process to get on their grad program, and I got to the final stage and then didn't get it. So I kind of thought maybe I want to do something in marketing. Applied for MNC Saatchi got to the final stage, didn't get it, yeah. ended up doing another random marketing job. And I was... Did you, ever like, get, did you ever get down that these were not going your way? or? Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Pissed off more yeah. than anything else. But you uh, seem like a kind of a person who can take blows. Maybe I look like that. Oh, really? Okay. It's yeah, hard. I it's can, hard. I can. But in uh, hindsight, when you look back... In hindsight, yeah, I remember being really upset, but it's the kind of thing where you just get up and go again. Go again, because I mean, you got a different. Kind what, of what's brain. the you option? Kind of <laughs> what's the other option? I thought that that's what I wanted to do, and I wanted to be living in London, and I wanted to have the London life, and I just really fucking hated it. And I was crossing. I remember what the moment it was. I was crossing the um, what's that bridge on the way to London? Was it London Bridge, mm, Tower Bridge? Maybe. And I was looking around and everyone just looked grey grey and miserable yeah. and I was like not up for this it was quite literally the question of putting my finger on a map and it sort of landed in next to Malawi and I was on a, like on a spinning globe or an atlas like on a flat well, I'm just gonna go here flat uh, and I was like I've never really done Africa. did you really do that though? yeah you, well, really you, came, you were working in. Well, so, you were trying to get a job and you hadn't gone. Yeah. Uh, Good job you didn't get a job in Well, well so I was working part time for this like marketing firm. Right. And it kind of landed in the general direction of it was like Malawi, Tanzania, Kenya. But you were doing it as a joke, or were you doing it as a No, I was no. doing it as like, I get. I'm getting out of here and I'm going to go. Boom. Yeah, I and think. Then you did it. I think it's almost like a kettle, you know, like it boils and yeah, boils yeah. and boils, and then you're like, throw all your talk, like, oh, I was like, fuck it, yeah. I've got to go. Yeah. I knew the general area that I wanted to be in, so I started looking at jobs. Imagine if there. the map had landed on London. Sorry. I'd, I'd go again. Best of three. I'd go again. Best of three. Best of three. It happened to land in a, in a part that was like exciting and yeah. sunny and uh you were planning to do this on your own. Yes. And now you're 22. Right. Yeah, 22. So it lands on Malawi and then what do you do? Go on the internet and start so, reading up about Malawi. One of the poorest countries in the world. One of the poorest countries in the world. And I ended up finding this random marketing job to do marketing for this NGO. So you went into you went on to the internet, said somewhere in Malawi, Malawi Tanzania kind of area. Yeah. I'm going to move there. What's available? So you yeah, said, okay. So <laughs> found a job. Yeah, moved there. 
worked for this wildlife kind of conservation NGO. It was amazing because they did a lot of rehabilitation and my little sort of accommodation bit where I was sharing with this vet who was the most... So you asking me if I was a feminist. Mm. You will never meet more hardcore women than women working in that part of the world. I shared... Well, or men. I mean, it's a brave thing to do. I mean, you really are sort of sundering... All any, men, like but... comforts, right? It wasn't a comfortable existence, was it? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. But, uh, but I got to listen... I was woken up every morning by the sound of lions right. and monkeys. Hopefully and... far away lions. No, so right next door. Oh, okay. Because they were in these big enclosures waiting to be oh, right. rehabilitated. So it was a nature reserve, was it? Yeah, so it's like an NGO that specialises in rehabilitating animals. Okay. So while they have them, they'll sort of nurse them back to health or if they're monkeys, they'll incorporate them into a troop and then they'll release the whole troop. Okay. So I worked with them for, what was it? Half, not even half a year, four months, and then got really interested in agriculture and food right. and famine there. Because I was in Malawi right at the end of the rainy season. Well, Malawi always sits on the cusp of a famine, right? It's always... It's, it's, it's always, yeah. But it doesn't, it's insane that it does. Mm. I couldn't understand... Why do you say that? So I was there during the end of the rainy season where everything grows like Malawi is one of the most fertile places right. it's just lush and green yeah. and yet for some reason when the country is at its most fertile where there's greenery everywhere it's also that's when the hungry season is so you, you're you were just going this doesn't make sense i was like this Why does is, not right. make yeah, any sense yeah. so I sort of started looking into it, speaking to other NGOs, speaking to farmers, um, like local Malawians that I was working with. And it's because Malawians and, well, Malawi in general has a subsistence economy which is based around the growth and cultivation of maize. Originally brought over from South America. And maize only grows with the rains. The rains come, you quickly put your maize seeds in your field, yeah. bearing in mind that close to 90% of all Malawians are smallhold farmers. Mm -hmm. And then during the rainy season, which is sort of December to April, and because maize is a very thirsty crop, that's when your maize grows. Mm -hmm. So you really get the harvest at sort of April, May, June, it's sort of starting to come in. So during this whole time, during the rainy period, you're just waiting for your food to grow. And hoping there's no problems floods with and all that pests stuff, yeah. and floods and yeah. bearing in mind that you're using very little fertilizer and with limited knowledge disease, of real yeah, yeah, yeah disease and then that maze has to last you to the following till the following harvest so the question you immediately say is why are so you why, planting you, maize? why are you only planting <laughs> maize <laughs> so i decided to learn more about this and why farmers were so hooked on only growing one crop and why it was very chemical fertilizer intensive because you get government subsidies for the fertilizer. This was you, just you looking at it or was it you working with another? No, so this was me. Right. So I'd stopped the marketing job yeah. and then ended up doing a permaculture course in the north of the country wow. for like two months. Right. And I learned. Explain what permaculture is. So permaculture is taking organic agriculture that step further. So it's only using natural resources for all of your farming inputs. So for example, instead of chemical fertilizers, you would use manures or green manures or manure teas. Um, you do things like companion planting. One plant really needs nitrogen. Yeah. You can plant a nitrogen fixing plant next to it. Yeah. So it's basically creating what nature does automatically but creating like a harmonious system does everyone at this stage in your life go, oh lou's lost out in africa just gone mad growing permaculture and looking after animals like is that like because you, you're doing something at that age that's so different i talked to people on the show who've done some different things with their lives you've done it particularly early it didn't feel like no, not for madness no, at the time. Sure there was an echo no, my, my parents thought I had... Lost it. Well, they didn't think no. I'd lost it because they knew that I was 
working really so while I was there I was doing a lot of I was doing a lot of writing more articles for like Huffington Post and things like that so they kind of knew that did they pay well or no, they didn't pay no. me. Um, they didn't pay me at all. Huffington Post. Huffington Post. You're supposed to be the um, of new journalism. I know. But I was young and my writing... So you were just like, what's happening in Malawi kind of articles, isn't it? Yeah, but also things like new tech that was coming in. So, so the, what, what uh, is Malawi like to live in? Like, were you living in a hotel or in a, no, you know, in a rented no, room? or no. Aircon? No. No, exactly. No power. Is it really dusty and no roads? It's dusty when it's the dry season. Mm. Malawi is one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to. It's a very peaceful country. There's brawls. (laughs) Civil brawls. Civil brawls. There's no civil war. And it's the most, of all the places I've ever been to, it's the most, the people are so incredibly tolerant of religion right. language and tribes right. so there's no tribal warfare there's it's amazing many muslim countries muslim, there's uh, quite a lot of christian because right. of the um Mission- missionaries yeah, missionaries but yeah <laughs> i rolled my eyes there with it <laughs> yeah no it's more. so in that respect it's very peaceful but and where did you live were you living in a Wattle hut or like tell me what was it like was so it when I was doing this permaculture course I was living at this sort of permaculture centre so I had yeah. a little tiny oh, house house but no when I say house it's like smaller than this room tin roof okay right and outside toilet and all that kind of yeah, stuff yeah 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 compost to- toilet chickens running around and all that yeah open to the lake I mean you learn did, you get, did you have any scrapes, near scares? Uh-oh. I had malaria three times. Right. I had Bilharzia twice. What's that? A parasite that you right. get from contaminated water. And it goes right. in through your hands and your feet. And then further down the line, it will lodge itself in your liver and you'll die. <laughs> but it's fine. You just have to, like, poo in a bag and then they give you medicine. Um, wow. I'm, I'm on a list at the London School of Tropical Medicine. You have some antibodies in there. I you have to. <laughs> so you're, you're doing the permaculture yeah, for two months. Sorry. And what happens then? I kind of decided that this is what I really, for the meantime anyway, really wanted to do. I wanted to work with people who are already doing this and try and spread permaculture techniques and permaculture practices mm. so that people can be, first of all, not reliant on chemicals and learn how to grow things and harvest water and stop a hungry season. Yes. So I ended up designing um, and implementing a few nutrition programs based on these like food forests. That's when I met my old boss, but still an amazing friend and still a mentor at a party, drunk. And I had a massive rant at him about the state of Malawi, the state of nutrition, the state of agriculture, how... I didn't he's un- Malawian or? No, so he's English. English, right. How I didn't understand how NGOs were doing fuck all, really, mm. ultimately, for the amount of money that they were getting. Did and you notice how- that one of the problems with NGOs is there's, too, there's often too many of them? Or well, it's too many cooks in the kitchen, isn't it? In I places. think the aid mentality and the structure of aid is actually what's kept the continent poor. Yeah. Have you, have you heard of a book called Dead Aid by Dan Moyo? She is amazing. She's like my amazing Tanzanian economist, but very, very smart. So I was having a rant at him. I was like, I don't understand. Where is the private sector or companies that want to do something? He was like, well, it's interesting that you should say that. Why don't you come to see what we're doing? And that's how I got the job. So he ran Malai Mangos. Mangos. What, what, what is that about? It was started by these two guys, Donny Jacobs and Craig Hardy, both London city boys. John used to work in financial law for Morgan Stanley mm-hmm. and Craig did something for RBS, I think. They had both come to Malawi as tourists, fallen in love with it, didn't understand why the country, like a bit like me, was so desperately poor. And they actually came during the mango season. The thing about Malawi is it's just mango town, like mango trees everywhere, so much so that millions of tons just rot on the ground. 
So they were there and they were you like... Made it, I have to be one more fucking mango. That's why it's like everyone has <laughs> yellow tongues during yeah. the season because that's all people eat. Yeah. And it's just everywhere. It's just like... And they're delicious. Gold. Oh, they're so good. Yeah. And so Johnny and Craig were like, there's a huge business opportunity here that no one is harnessing. Because the problem is... Do they not even export their mangoes? There's no infrastructure to be able oh, to do that. Okay. There's no roads. There's the tiniest airport. There's no way to do post-harvest processing right. and there's just no structure to be able to do it long story short they managed to get something like 50 million of investment from world bank and vcs built malawi's first huge processing unit ended up expanding to four thousand hectares of state-of-the-art drip irrigated moving to organics but some of the best mangoes that they were that you can grow, mm -hmm. some from India, Alfonso mangoes, some from Kenya, and had managed to create this, first of all, amazing farm, fantastic business, but off the back of the business, they saw, in terms of development of a country, instead of aid, it was, you need to give people jobs and the opportunity to make an income if you really want to lift them outside of, out of yeah. poverty. So off the back of this model, they also worked with 5,000 smallholders around the factory. So it ranged from people who had five trees on their yeah, land. They bring a basket in and they exactly. It gets processed and then it was shipped to people like Innocent Smoothie, Coca Cola, mm. PepsiCo. Right. So they're doing what, you know, New Zealand did with kiwi fruit and Ethiopia did with coffee, and they're taking the, co the core natural resource that, as you said, is just left rotting around the beach. Yeah and putting it in packaging and putting a brand name on which is a pretty cool brand name actually and making making Malawi the capital of mangoes of the world is that it? Trying to Trying or at least approaching poverty in a way that you're allowing yeah. people to make their own income mm. because Malawians are incredibly proud hard-working mm. wonderful people who just have no means. Is there a corrupt government or? I mean, yeah. Presumably, welcome to Africa. Yeah, welcome to Africa. But it's not as corrupt as, as <laughs> some. And I think saying that, I mean, yes, the government has a lot to do with it because they're not putting the money into the right things like roads, electricity. No, you have to open the government's eyes by doing stuff like this and they go, ooh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so how long do you spend with them? Closer to two and a half ish years okay so you were three years in Malawi roughly over, yeah right? give or take okay. so what was the little thing that made you leave because it felt like you'd been looking for somewhere to land and oh now I found it oh. it was it was a few things I was living in the middle of nowhere as much as the job was my life and I loved that I missed and I missed it or yeah or so yeah. my boyfriend was is probably the most understanding man in the whole planet who was so, who understood, he was like, this is your dream, go do it, we'll make it work. He came over, I went back. I did like long stints in London because we were doing a lot with Rome and the UN at the time. So I was able right. to spend like two months here, two months there okay. and go back and forth. I missed electricity. Washing uh, your hair. I, I washed my hair, but, <laughs> um, uh, but I got really good at bucket baths. And also there was a pivot in the company. I mean, this is a whole other massive long story, but basically the investors came back and decided that we were pouring too much money into social projects, sustainability, right. community empowerment, all that stuff. And they were like the very bad people who originally had taken a shot and put the money into the company had now turned around and was like actually having owning 51%. They said, actually, we don't care about all of the sustainable business model. We just want you to produce the Mangoes. cheapest product oh, possible. Where were they from? Were, what country were those investors from? The uh, the Dutch. Dutch. But they, so, well, some of them are Dutch, but I, I feel like I can't say the name. But their portfolio is mainly oil and gas. There we have it. And mining. There we have it. So, well, that must have they didn't terrible. understand that, especially in agriculture, to build something truly transformational with long-term impact you're not going to get a so return the, on your the profit the two boys who came from a banking background had a pure idea to have a win-win situation a bit like starbucks and the coffee even though 
you know more progressive and more, impressive yeah. than that but yeah well, it's, it's quickly turned into let's just get them as cheap as possible well so is it still going I can't say that it's still going because right. it's not what it was the yeah so the founders left I remember that it sounds like it was a high drama time it was I felt like something in me had died oh. when I was told it was like a bit of my heart was just ripped out we were just on the up and we got so much traction and we're starting to do we got to talk about it a lot on public platforms so we would go to the UN and be like this is how we see development this is how we're doing it in Malawi in the place that no one thought we could do it because no, it's business is so difficult to do that just step on that for a minute at, at the end of the day this is a a bunch of people in a room who are investors who have consciences who have children who have an understanding of poverty, who have an understanding of the state of these countries, who are businessmen, who do want to make a profit, but who've kind of, in a very kind of evil kind of way, gone, Oh, ha, ha, it ha, is 100% no, evil. I am going to do this yes, and fuck things because up even more. I think for the people very high up, it's a question of numbers not adding up. Yeah. But the people that they then sent in, this company was, we had probably five expats, but the rest were Malawians because it was they wanted it to build it as a company run mm. by Malawians for Malawians. When they brought in these evil investors, sent in new management. Part of that was bringing over on the ground managers from South Africa. Right. Now this isn't a blanket term for how all South Africans operate. I'm these okay are just the, white, <laughs> South Africans, white South Africans. These are just the South Africans that we got sent. Yeah. But it is a very different type. We are here to make money. Of, but yelling, yeah. racist yeah. comments. Yeah. And the thing that was holding this company together was, so the farms didn't have any fences. Mm. Trust, hope. All of the unity. community realized that this was their golden ticket. And we employed, we employed all of the community. So they, re they realized that if they stole from the farm, whether it was one mango, one banana, or one pipe, that was going to affect them yeah, and their really children. Yeah. But as soon as everything changed, the South Africans came in, everything got taken. So that means you're working in a completely different environment. Mm. You need guard dogs, you need yeah. patrolmen, you need security, you need to implement fear. It's like the mining industry, right? Yeah. Well, you know... Well, I don't know what to say with that. It's just you, you. I, I keep going back to the point that even these city Africans who are coming over have got children, a conscience, a soul, any sense of care or understanding about what what is happening in Africa. And I know Africans hate saying it's not just Africa. There's lots of different yeah. problems, but quite a lot but, of the problems yeah. in quite a lot of the countries are based on this kind of attitude, and also crushing people who try to do it right. No one's learning and no one's being compassionate. You know? Yeah. Also, trying to find even people like you've done what you've done or people like that, they're very few and far between who are brave enough to not do as they're told, or go and explore their life in their 20s and try and do good. It, it knocks the stuffing out of those people. Because mm. you, you, you can get jaundiced, you can get jaded, you can get delus delusioned by it. Well, well, you know, we're, we're, do you want help? Or we're trying to help. Uh, but that's what it's like. I think any Somebody big dying. change is going to be an uphill struggle. I'm almost glad that this happened to me when I was that age, so a few years ago, because it was a kick of reality, of what it's really going to take. Mm. But don't, don't those South Africans, whatever evil investors, don't they represent all that's wrong with capitalism today? 100%. You know, we're at... I'm not talking about saying, oh, we have to go back to socialism and everyone has to be equal. But when people come in and trod on people who are trying to dig themselves out of a ditch and kick them back into it repeatedly just so they can make an extra yeah. couple of bucks, that's the immorality of capitalism that everyone seems to just ignore and just I, go, oh, yeah, it's fine. We're trickle down, trickle down economics, trickle down the hill back yeah. into the gutter economics. Because you know? it's, a, it's a structure that makes this a moral behavior legal yeah and they were well within their legal yeah. rights to do everything that we they are did well within our legal rights to do i actually think that's what they said <laughs> i know fuck off i was like but what about 
your human rights, humanity. Oh, they, they don't, they don't it just yeah, it was a heartbreak of frustration and just I just couldn't believe that there were people in the world who were like. Did this. you find it hard to pick yourself up? No, because I was I pissed I bet, off. Yeah. I mean, I was devastated. This is only a couple oh. of years ago when it all finished. But a few years. Yeah, ago. two years ago. Yeah. But thankfully, the two guys that started it, Johnny and Craig, are. I mean, I can't even imagine what it must have been like for them. Like yeah. this was their labor of love. They poured their heart and truly their soul into it. How did it play reporting wise in Malawi when this started happening? Awful. I bet. And the thing is, and who better than to come in in South Africa? Yeah. yeah, it was. It was. Wow. Yeah, very oh, sad. Gosh. There's this whole other very long story, but they call me Hummingbird. This like little like, mm. um, he was like, what we're trying to do was never going to be easy. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to do it. Yeah. And so I'm very fortunate that I have these incredible mentors who are like, this is not, you know, this is not mm. the end. And for them now, they're going to they go they've gone on to do even more large scale incredible it's projects. Great to see because they have such an amazing reputation now yeah. as the guys who were told they weren't able to do it. And then they still made this amazing business mm. and had an incredible model. So now they're kind of utilizing all that experience to do more awesome stuff. Right. And um, just going go a bit macro before we finish, what, 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 is, what is your view of the world as a sort of a you know, progressive millennial? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I fluctuate between I'm trying to do my teacher training in yoga on, mm-hmm. on the side and sort of reading a lot of like Buddhist texts and philosophy around that mm-hmm. and I fluctuate between me accepting that we are just the tiniest speck in time that in the big 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 picture of things doesn't actually matter mm-hmm. and sometimes that actually brings me quite a lot of piece I'm like yeah and I think you have to have it if you're working in this field it's just a undertone of consistent optimism Mm. that things will change and you may not be able to be the person that makes the big change or that Mm. makes the shift or starts the wave but at least you tried and Mm. started something and you don't know how your actions ripple or how they affect other people there's a certain humility required. Buddhism teaches you that. You know? Yeah. There's an awful lot of, particularly in the business I work, there's an awful lot of, oh, look what I did, and look at the award I made, and look what, you know, it's just like the world needs to you, get away from Yeah, that, you, know? you need to, if you are able to take your ego out of it, yeah. there is so much more that you can do. And I think mindfulness is, a, you know, all of that, which is a really big coming wave at the moment because people are so... Lost. Lost and confused. And, you know, so there's so much mental illness that I see which is just people who can't quite cope you know, yeah. with, 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 with stuff what would, last question what would you say to um, you know a young 17 year old boy <laughs> or girl who's listening to this and maybe thinking of putting their finger on a map and doing it the way that I see it is that almost in life you have a yes path and a no path if you go start saying yes to things and start going down the yes path, it becomes easier to say yes to everything. You've just got to get on that journey first. I would say just just do it. So you mean just do it. get into the Red Bull, we get you into Nike. Just do it. <laughs> but your point is on the no path, though, that the no path is a least resistant path and it's, yeah. it's a fearful path and it's, oh, what might happen? And the yes path is just embracing opportunities. I think, yeah, you. I think that's what I'm trying to do say. Do you think eventually that you'll settle into one thing for a long time or do you think part of your makeup is that you like to go in and that you exhaust. I mean, I found that, for example, a lot of my jobs, I very rarely lasted more than three years. And mm. Partly because of what I did in, in many cases. You know, you do it and someone goes, that's shit. And I go, oh, that's all I got. But, <laughs> I think, yeah. but do you think that this whole idea that you might find one thing to champion or will you always go, I've nudged that into that direction. Now I'm going to go and have a look at this. Now I'm going to have a look at this. 
part of me wants to go back to Malawi to kind of like yeah. finish what was started there. I think I'll always work in this field, whether it's for clean tech or farming or anything like that. I think I'll be involved in different projects, mm. but I think the general trajectory and of what I'm doing will stay, stay the same. It's great having somebody out there like you, Lou, uh, I must say, as a, guy oh, who's so about nice. to turn 50, <laughs> as a guy who's about to, about to turn 50, and I don't hear an awful lot of positive views on the world in this show where people look to the future. So best of luck with it, and uh, Thank thanks you. for being on a planet, Sean. It was a pleasure. <laughs>